Okay, good morning. Good morning. So, I, just to remind you, we were talking about morphogens and the control of spatial pattern in developing tissues yesterday. So, I want to, and we sort of had this kind of structure, so talked a bit about each of these things. So, I want to briefly recap on, on these ideas, but do that by focusing on the neural tube, the system that I'm particularly interested in. And so to do that, just let me, first of all, just briefly introduce you to key aspects of the vertebrate neural tube. So as I'm sure you all know, um, the neural tube is, part of, is the central nervous system of vertebrate embryos. We particularly focus on the spinal cord. And we do that because it's an important part of us. You know, it's one of the defining features of us as vertebrates. Uh, but it's also functionally important, so it allows us to perceive our environment um, by touch, pain, heat, etc., and also control our response to our environment by controlling motor output. Um, it's part of the, the, the central nervous system, and it's arranged in a very similar manner to the rest of the central nervous system, with functionally distinct neuronal subtypes being spatially segregated. So in the dorsal spinal cord, so that's the bit of your spinal cord closest to the skin of your back, are neurons which receive sensory information from the periphery. They process that information, either sending it up into the brain or down into the ventral region of the spinal cord, where the interneurons and motor neurons that control motor output are located. So that arrangement with the functionally segregated positioning of those different neuronal subtypes arises early in development with the segregated generation of, of different uh, neurons. So if we go back in development from the adult spinal cord to the embryonic spinal cord, so this is actually a cross-section through a chick embryo about 48 hours after the egg was laid. So at this time, you can already see uh, an established dorsal-ventral axis. But at this point in time, most of the cells within the forming spinal cord are proliferating progenitors. They're highlighted here in red. So these occupy the most medial aspect of the uh, neural tube. And um, it's an epithelium with the apical surface on the inside and basal surfaces around the outside. So progenitors are located at the apical surface, towards the apical side of the neural tube. But it's a pseudostratified epithelium with these uh, nuclei, these cell bodies undergoing movement, apical and basal movement during this uh, time. As progenitors commit and differentiate into post-mitotic neurons, they migrate in an apical to lateral direction. So the first-born neurons are situated around the lateral edges of the neural tube, and here they're identified by the, the green uh, staining. And already at this point in development, there's dorsal-ventral pattern. So along the dorsal-ventral axis, we can distinguish distinct neuronal subtypes uh, based on molecular gene expression patterns, molecular profile. Similarly, along the dorsal ventral axis of the progenitors, we can also distinguish um, distinct domains, distinct blocks of progenitors. And we can do that with a set of uh, looking at the expression of a set of markers. These are all transcription factors. So if we look at this set of transcription factors, uh, what you notice immediately is that they are all expressed in progenitors. <laughs> but each of them has a slightly different domain of gene expression. So um, in these first four slides here, the first four images here, the green genes are expressed in the dorsal neural tube down to some ventral limit, and each of these has a slightly different ventral limit of expression. And the two red genes here have, have the opposite characteristic. They're expressed from ventral to particular dorsal limits of expression. So if we look at the combination of genes expressed at any of those positions along the DV axis, we can uniquely identify uh, that position. So the combination of gene expression allows us to define uh, domains of progenitors arrayed along that axis. Um, work I'm really not going to get into today, 
um, indicates that this uh, combinatorial transcriptional code is responsible for neuronal subtype identity. So if we manipulate this code, so knocking out genes or misexpressing genes, then we have predictable consequences on the neuronal subtype generated. So if we want to understand how you generate that spatial pattern of neurons, what we have to do is to understand how you generate this spatial pattern of gene expression within progenitors. And as I mentioned yesterday, um, this pattern of gene expression is dependent on signals emanating from the dorsal and ventral poles of the neural tube. And today I'm going to focus on the ventral half of the neural tube and hedgehog signaling. So sonic hedgehog secreted glycoprotein, which is produced by notochord, a rod of axiom mesodermal cells that underlies the neural tube, and slightly later by specialized cells at the ventral midline of the neural tube itself called the floor plate. Okay, so just before I get into sort of the developmental biology details, I just want to re-emphasize this. There is a functional consequence here. So you want to generate the right types of neurons at the right position because that's essential for establishing uh, functional circuitry within the neural tube. So you know, to make the complicated uh, feedback circuits that allow us to coordinate and control uh, motor movement, then you need um, a highly complex circuitry within the spinal cord. And that first step in generating that circuitry is making the right number of neurons the right type in the right position. But now I've said that, I'm going to completely ignore this, and we can just sort of focus on the abstract problem of how you generate these patterns of gene expression. So there's several lines of evidence that hedgehog signaling is important for generating this pattern in the ventral neural tube, and several lines of evidence that some type of graded activity of hedgehog is important. So for example, we can recapitulate this in vitro with different concentrations of recombinant hedgehog. So if we take an early chick embryo, so this is a diagram of a 10 somite embryo, uh, and we can explant out a little region of the forming neural plate, so cells which will go on to become the neural tube, and we can culture that ex vivo in tissue culture and add defined concentrations of recombinant hedgehog to, uh, to those cultures. So if we just take one of those explants, culture it in without any added hedgehog, and then we look at gene expression, then the majority of cells in the absence of hedgehog express uh, gene expression such as PAX7, characteristic of the dorsal neural tube. If we add a moderate concentration of hedgehog, so this is one nanomolar hedgehog, then PAX7 is no longer expressed, and instead we see this red gene, OLIG2, which is characteristic of the middle of the ventral neural tube. So in fact, OLIG2 is expressed in those progenitors which will go on to generate motor neurons. So these are, the, these are your future uh, motor neurons. If instead of one nanomolar hedgehog, we use four nanomolar hedgehog, then instead of the red gene, we get the green gene, and the green gene is another transcription factor, NKX22, expressed in progenitors uh, ventral to the OLIG2 domain, right adjacent to the floor plate, the source of hedgehog itself. So this is sort of classic kind of data which um, is interpreted within the context of that morphogen idea. So different concentrations of hedgehog result in the induction of different gene expression, and the gene expression induced, uh, the concentration corresponds to the position within the gradient one would uh, expect to see uh, those cell types. But of course, it's, it's more complicated than this. So these explants are all assayed 24 hours after we've added hedgehog to them. But we can look at similar explants at different stages after the addition of hedgehog. So here we're using that high concentration of hedgehog for nanomolar, which at 24 hour induces a high response gene, NKX22. But if we look at explants treated for 12 hours with high concentrations of hedgehog, now many of the cells in those explants express the red gene, the low response OLIG2 uh, gene. And we can see a transition from OLIG2 to NKX22 over this time period. So if we count the number of cells expressing each of the uh, responding 
uh, genes, we see OLIG2 being more rapidly but transiently induced by high levels, high concentrations of hedgehog, whereas NKX22 is delayed in its induction, and its induction correlates with when OLIG2, the number of OLIG2 expressing cells, is decreasing. So somehow we need to explain why we're getting these dynamics in gene expression. I'm going to, can, yeah, I mean, okay. the next half an hour, hopefully I will explain that. And then, which is related to this point, we need to think about, so this is looking at the extracellular concentration, manipulating the extracellular concentration of hedgehog. But as you remember yesterday, we discussed this idea that signal transduction pathways introduce dynamics, and there might not be a straightforward relationship between the extracellular concentration of hedgehog and intracellular uh, signaling. Um, and indeed, remember, so in the case of hedgehog signaling, the GLE proteins are the transcriptional effectors of hedgehog signaling. And if we measure GLE activity within the neural tube, then we see complicated dynamics of GLE activity. So just to remind you of this plot, this is looking at developmental time along the x-axis, then uh, GFP intensity, which is uh, monitoring GLE activity. And each of these lines represents different positions in the neural tube from ventral, uh, 0% at the ventral midline up to 50% um, in the middle of the neural tube. So if we look at any one particular time point here, we see high levels of glial acti activity ventrally decreasing uh, as you move dorsally in the neural tube. But if you look over time, then the amplitude of that gradient changes quite markedly. So if you think about a cell, if you think yourself into the position of a cell sitting somewhere within the, the ventral neural tube, then you're uh, seeing, you're uh, uh, harboring different levels of glial activity over developmental time. And somehow you're using that dynamics of glial activity to generate those spatial temporal patterns of gene expression. So the challenge is, how do, how do we accommodate, how do we account for these observations? So what I want to argue is that this spatial pattern of gene expression in response to those complicated dynamics of hedgehog signaling are dependent on the downstream response itself. So as well as being nice markers for different progenitors in the neural tube, these are all transcription factors, and they're linked together uh, by regulatory interactions. So specific uh, regulatory interactions between these genes generates a transcriptional network. And I'm going to argue it's that transcriptional network which is essential for converting the dynamics of glial activity into these temporal spatial patterns of gene expression. <coughs> so some of the evidence for this uh, comes from straightforward developmental genetics. We can knock out one or more of these genes and ask what happens to the remaining genes. Um, so I'm going to illustrate this by focusing on this boundary here. Damn it, I keep meaning to change this side because the colors are mixed. But, um, so if we focus on this dorsal boundary of NKX22, so you can see that this corresponds to the vent ventral limit of PAC6, which is expressed throughout dorsal progenitors with the exception of the NKX22 domain. In addition, OLIG2 uh, is also, um, its ventral limit of all expression is also uh, corresponding to the dorsal limit of NKX22. So these progenitors here express a combination of PAC6 and OLIG2. Yeah? Right. So at this point in development, so this is the first wave of differentiation. It's entirely neurogenic. So in fact, and this, I'm not going to talk about this at all, the switch to gliogenic uh, generation happens at a later time. So in mouse, I'm talking about the period of, neuro, the period of neural development from uh, about E8.5 to E12.5. Subsequent to E12.5, there's a switch to gliogenic generation. However, all of these cell types will be generated prior to E12.5, 
and they're not generated subsequently. So in Chick, this corresponds to um, that this transition to gliogenesis that happens at about embryonic day uh, four to five. In humans, this would be, um, so this period of neurogenesis in humans would be at about the uh, four weeks after fertilization, and the gliogenic switch happens a week or 10 days later. So this is purely neurogenic. You don't generate glia cells at this time point. So if we just focus on this, uh, this boundary here, then, oops, sorry, then we can um, look at the effect on NKX22 expression when we knock out OLIG2, PAC6, or both OLIG2 and PAC6. So that's the image you've just seen in wild-type embryos. So if we knock out OLIG2, there's no OLIG2 protein, and what you notice is a small but a noticeable expansion in the dorsal limit of NKX22. In a PAC6 mutant, remember PAC6 is expressed throughout this uh, region. In a PAC6 mutant, uh, there's a more striking expansion of NKX22 and concomitantly some repression of OLIG2. And notice that cells remain green and red, right? So there's still a mutually exclusive expression of OLIG2 and NKX22, but there's more NKX22 cells. In a double mutant lacking both OLIG2 and PAC6, now that expansion of NKX22 is really quite marked. And you can see, so just by eyeballing this, this new domain of NKX22 appears to uh, fill both uh, what would normally be the NKX22 and OLIG2 domain in wild-type embryos. And indeed, that, that's the case. So if you measure the position of this new dorsal limb of NKX22, it corresponds to where you would normally expect to see uh, OLIG2 being expressed. So if we think about this from just interpreting the, the genetics, then what this is suggesting is that the differential response of NKX22 and OLIG2 to hedgehog signaling is actually dependent on OLIG2 and PAC6. If we remove OLIG2 and PAC6, now NKX22 responds very similarly to OLIG2. So that suggests that this downstream transcriptional network plays a major role in interpreting uh, graded hedgehog signaling. So we were interested in trying to address that question in more detail. So to do that, I'm going to introduce one further transcription factor. So the fourth one I'm going to introduce is a transcription factor called Iroquois 3, also expressed in neural progenitors. And like PAC6 is expressed throughout the dorsal neural tube, and its ventral limit of expression corresponds to the dorsal limit of OLIG2. So these four transcription factors define two boundaries at different positions along the dorsal ventral axis. So the OLIG2 Iroquois 3 boundary and uh, this boundary we just looked at between the dorsal limit of NKX22 and the ventral limit of OLIG2 and PAC6. So the type of genetic experiments and both loss of functions, which I've shown you, and gain of function experiments, suggest a uh, set of regulatory interactions illustrated in, in this cartoon with cross-oppressive interactions noticeable, really dominating the interactions between those four transcription factors. In addition, as I've shown you a few slides ago, both OLIG2 and NKX22 depend on hedgehog signaling for their expression. So, yeah. Can you speak through it to show before where you were uh, explanting the, the tissue and then adding some hedgehog? Do you know if the, the patch needs to be uh, intact somehow or you, if you can dissociate cells uh, and uh, yeah. similar results? So you can absolutely get similar results. So one way we've done that is using, and the way we do that these days is not using explants, but using ES cells, which we've dif differentiated to neural progenitors, and then adding appropriate um, amounts of hedgehog or hedgehog agonists to that. So, no, we don't have any evidence of um, that cell-cell interactions are important. In addition to those type of experiments, the type of experiments I showed early on yesterday where we were ectopically expressing patched in small groups of cells in the intact neural tube 
and seeing cell autonomous changes in gene expression also argue against any major role for cell-cell communication. So you're seeing, so in those kind of manipulations, you're also seeing a, a cell autonomous effect. Adjacent cells are behaving as, as, as they would do normally. So is there evidence for this network mainly genetics, or you have some biochemical evidence? So I'm going to come on, hopefully come on to oh, biochemistry later because, on. Because right there are some, it's interesting that you could go around some loops, yeah. and, and, uh, and you can write only two repress PAC6 directly, but then you also repress a repressor of PAC6. Yes, and that's so going to become important in a few slides' time. Okay. So in, in amniotes, so chicken, mouse, um, where we've looked at this, we, again, we don't find any strong evidence for cell arrangements. So it's a, it's a pseudostratified epithelium. It's, so when we look at clones, so marking individual cells, looking at the shape of clones later on, so sisters stay relatively close to each other. They don't disperse uh, very broadly. And there's no evidence that clones at the boundary have a different shape to clones within the center of a, a domain. So that's sort of negative evidence, but it, it's consistent with an absence of any effect on cell rearrangement or the cell adhesion. But I think it's still an open question and still needs um, more attention. Okay, so we've got a uh, a genetic network here. So the questions we wanted to ask is, um, so can this network explain the spatial temporal behavior in gene expression? And if so, how is it doing that? So the way we've approached this is to convert this cartoon into a, a dynamical systems model so we can take those uh, interactions and then describe them by four linked um, differential equations which um, so we're using a particular formula formulation to describe gene expression based on um, a statistical thermodynamic description of gene regulation the details don't matter so much in um, but what we're describing is that each of the components each of the transcription factors within this network um, are regulated as described within this network and then have linear degradation. So in terms of the uh, uh, regulation, um, then there are, sort of th there are three components that can go into that regulation. And the reasons for this we'll come back to um, shortly. So the three components are for NKX22 and OLIG2, they have a hedgehog signaling input. And remember that Glee activity in the absence of hedgehog is a repressor, in the presence of hedgehog is an activator. So NKX22 and OLIG2 have an input from um, hedgehog signaling. All four uh, transcription factors have um, inputs from a spatially uniform basal activation, and that will become important. And then the third input is the network input, if you like, the repressive interactions as described by this cartoon. So we can, so we're taking this cartoon, turning it into a series of four linked uh, differential equations, and then obviously we need to parameterize this. So to parameterize this set of equations, we've taken um, uh, an optimization approach. And to do this, we've um, collaborated with Chris Barnes at University College London, who has been developing um, an optimization approach along with other people based on um, approximate Bayesian computation. <coughs> so I'm, I'm sh sorry. I'm so I think most of you will be familiar with um, optimization um, strategies. Um, this optimization strategy, like many others, the, the basic principle is that you start off with um, uh, a parameter space. So in our case, we have, I think it's 
14 or 15 parameters in our model. But just for illustrative purposes, if you imagine a model with two parameters, you pick specific values for those two parameters from initial uh, range, uh, possible range of parameters. You simulate your model with those, that choice of values, and you end up with some output of your model. You compare that output to some target objective, and if it meets, if it's close enough to that target objective, you keep that parameter set. If not, you throw that parameter set away. And you do that several billion times. There's also some other uh, uh, computational magic in there as well. But what you end up with is a set of parameter values which meet the criteria um, you, you've set out to do, you've set out to accomplish. So using this particular approach, one of the nice features of using ABC is that you don't end up with just single uh, parameter set optimized for, for your um, your target, what you end up with is, is a set of um, posterior ranges, so uh, the range of values which meet your target. So in our case, the optimization, the targets we wanted to optimize were the behavior of the model under the uh, genetic perturbations um, that we knew from the experimental data. So we wanted the model to fit both the wild-type spatial pattern but also the spatial patterns obtained when we knock out one or more of the uh, components of the network. So you see at the top line here is these are the objectives set by the optimization, and here is an example solution showing that we're, um, this particular example solution meets fairly um, well the, the targets within that we set uh, for the optimization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of, yeah, exactly. So what we did in this case, we sort of starting, and I think that's an important point about optimization. There's, there's um, a, a lot of often hidden features of optimizations that you don't appreciate until you really go into the details. So one of those is initial conditions. So the initial conditions we chose were to um, what we felt represented the initial conditions in the neural tube which were to have um, high levels of Iroquois 3 and PAC6. So that's the, uh, that's the expression of genes you would expect in the absence of hedgehog signaling, so equivalent of the dorsal neural tube. The other sort of, I mean, so doing more optimizations, one thing I've noticed is that the key thing with uh, these optimizations is actually how you define your scores, so how you actually... Um, determine um, how good your outputs are compared to your objectives. Often yeah. when people do this exercise, then they learn that there's few parameters that seem to be very important, and then you yeah. okay. Right. And so one of the nice things about ABC is you get out these um, posterior distributions of possible parameters. So this is the output of that particular optimization. So these are all of the parameters um, which were uh, unconstrained, which were, we were optimizing for. So exactly, so if you just look at these ranges, so what you can immediately see is that some of the parameters can have pretty much any value. So for example, this parameter here, which is actually the, um, uh, so it's the strength of Iroquois repression on NKX22. So that can take on pretty much any value, so it's uh, unconstrained, it's not an important component of the model. Whereas other parameter values uh, are much more restricted in the possible values they can take. And in addition, you can begin to see this, uh, some relationships between uh, certain pairs of parameters. And actually, you know, here you're seeing the marginal distributions of each of those parameters. But in this framework, we can also look at the joint distributions of parameters. So you begin to get a sense of the shape of the, this, uh, whatever it is, 14 or 15 dimensional space. So if you look at these two parameters, so this is the strength of Iroquois repression on OLIG2, and that's the opposite, OLIG2 on Iroquois. So you can immediately see that there's a difference there. So OLIG2 appears to be a stronger repressor, repressor of Iroquois than Iroquois is of OLIG2. So this gives us now a uh, parameter sets which 
will perform the task we set it to. So it will give us those spatial patterns of gene expression. So one thing now with these posterior distributions is we can choose particular values for each of those parameters and go back and re-simulate the, the, the model just to begin to look at the behavior. Any cross-validation? Yeah, so that's, that's some of the, the computational magic going on there. So I'd refer to Chris Barnes's work, papers on the ABC technique. So there's, it's not just simply randomly picking parameters and then doing that without any thought about what you're doing. But there are, you know, there are many optimization techniques, not only ABC. So, okay, so if we do that, so now we take a, a specific set of parameters and look at the, uh, we simulate the model. So now we're simulating this across a uh, simulated ventral to dorsal gradient. So high levels of hedgehog signaling ventrally decreasing as you go dorsal in the neural tube and looking at the steady state um, a pattern. So consistent with the objective we set, we see high levels of NKX22 in a ventral stripe, OLIG2 in an intermediate stripe, and then high levels of PAX6 and Iroquois3 in uh, the dorsal, at low uh, levels of hedgehog input. So that's what we asked it to do, and it's doing it, which is good. In addition, we can uh, look in silico at the effect of mutants, so we can look at a PAX6 mutant. So this is just removing... Uh, PAX6 equation, and what you can see is that you see an expansion of NKX22, reduction in the stripe of OLIG2, uh, no PAX6, obviously. And so again, that's what we asked it to do, and we asked it to do that because that's what the genetics were telling us. So this is um, all consistent with the objectives we set, and the, 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 sim the optimization appears to have worked. So what was more striking is when we looked at the behavior, uh, at aspects of the behavior we hadn't put into the optimization. So uh, most importantly, we looked at the, the dynamics of uh, the simulation. So all of the optimization was focused on the, the steady state behavior. But what we noticed is that the uh, parameter sets that passed the optimization gave us back the appropriate dynamics. So if we simulate uh, the model over time with a level of hedgehog signaling that a long time gives us NKX22, we always see a transient expression of OLIG2. And remember, that's what we're seeing from the experimental data. So OLIG2 is transiently induced prior to the induction of NKX22. Yeah. So this is because we're looking at steady state here. So if you look at the simulation, you see you're getting, so at the dynamics, you'll see you're getting um, an increase in NKX22 as OLIG2 is decreasing. So one simplification, of course, in the model is that we have a single equation for gene expression. In reality, of course, that's going to be a combination of RNA transcription and protein translation but we're not separating that out in, in the mathematical model. So here, I mean, and this is something we're interested in looking at in more detail now. Here it would be interesting to try and disentangle that. So how much does the protein behavior lag behind the transcriptional behavior? They're all important, right? So if you, so here, if we've removed PAC6, you also see a different behavior. So that's the full network. We manipulate, we remove PAC6, and you get a different behavior. So it's the entire system. You can't, I don't think you can begin to say this, this component is important and the others aren't. Yeah, so in, in the model, we've non-dimensionalized time. So then we can just reimpose it when we do the simulations. So 
And that's another interesting point. So what is it, what's controlling the time scale within the model? And the most influential parameters um, for the time scale are degradation rates, which you might suspect anyway. But so the, within the model, we can manipulate this time scale, these dynamics, by changing the degradation rate of the proteins. So in this particular, in these simulations, we've got a, uh, a constant gradient where it's um, temporally constant but spatially non-uniform. No, and I'll come on to, so as I showed you, in the real case, you're seeing dynamics of signaling going up and going down at a particular, I'm just about to talk about that. Sorry? What does it mean? What's, I'm not sure what answer you want for that. So it's, a, it's an observation. So we're seeing, so there's a transient within the, within the network in which you see a transient induction of OLIG2 prior to the induction of NKX22. And experimentally, we also see a similar transient expression of OLIG2 prior to the induction of NKX22. There's a, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, because we're not, we, in that paper, we weren't considering this boundary. So effectively, the simulation stopped there. Yes. So, in fact, if we have time, I'm going to come on to describe analytical results which explain why you get that transient, if we have time. Okay. So, if we put these together, so we've got this. So, in response to, at steady state, in response to a gradient, a spatial gradient of glial activity, we see these stripes of gene expression. And dynamically, we're also seeing this um, sequential induction. So there's, we can't, and they're both a consequence of the same um, regulatory interaction. So we can't separate out that spatial and temporal behavior. They're both a consequence of the interactions within that regulatory network. So one way of thinking about this then is to sort of these kind of draw this, what you might call a phase portrait of the system, where we're looking at behavior over time uh, compared to threshold, compared to, sorry, level of glee activity. So, and then the initial conditions, as you see at time zero, we're considering the initial conditions to be Iroquois 3 and PAC 6 on, so a dorsal-like condition. So what you can see, if you look at this behavior, then you see that to get the high response gene NKX22, you need uh, a certain threshold, a certain level of hedgehog signaling higher than for the low response gene. But having that level of signaling isn't sufficient. You have to have it for long enough. So you need that signal for longer to get NKX22 than to get OLIG2. And the only way to get from your initial state into an NKX22 state is transient through uh, the expression of OLIG2. So there's no way of getting into an NKX22 state without transiently expressing OLIG2. So one thing this does then is to, it connects the uh, sort of gradient, the, the classic morphogen spatial and temporal behavior. And I just want to emphasize that point by just going back to um, mentioning this result from John Paul Vincent and colleagues looking at the expression of wingless in uh, the Drosophila wing disc and reminding you their results indicating that wingless didn't need to be secreted to generate a, a spatial pattern of gene expression. But over time, it's, uh, the pattern of wingless expression itself changed, suggesting that cells at the furthest distance from the later dorsal ventral boundary saw wingless for only a short period of time, 
where cells close to the dorsal ventral boundary saw wingless for a long period of time. So in the context of this kind of uh, dynamical system, then either duration or level of signaling, and actually a combination of both, will give you the same result. So from the perspective of the nucleus, you know, from the perspective of uh, pattern of gene expression, it doesn't matter whether it's level or duration. It's a combination of both which are necessary to create that spatial pattern of gene expression. The other thing that this begins to suggest an answer to is how cells are interpreting those changing dynamics of signaling over time. So again, this system will... So, for example, you can see how cells exposed to different uh, levels of signaling over time will behave. So a transient high level of signaling, um, if it's not sustained for long enough, will not be sufficient to induce NKX22. So that, that observation suggested an answer to uh, what had been an anomalous result within the field. I'm going to show you this. It gets a little complicated, but I think it's a good example of how this, the mathematical model helped us understand some previous results. So this previous result is um, looking at a mouse mutant for GLEE3. So as I mentioned, there are three GLEE proteins within uh, vertebrates, and GLEE3 happens to be the main contributor to repressive activity. So in a GLEE3 mutant, uh, if we compare wild-type embryos to a GLEE3 mutant at the level of GLEE activity within the neural tube using that reporter for uh, hedgehog signaling for GLEE activity, we see in a GLEE3 mutant significantly increased levels of GLEE activity, uh, consistent with GLEE3 predominantly providing repressor activity. However, surprisingly, that increased level of glee activity has little, if any, effect on patterning within the neural tube. So you see the domain of NKX22 in a glee 3 mutant looks uh, similar to a wild-type embryo. So that seems, to be, that seems to contradict this idea of hedgehog signaling glee activity functioning as a morphogen. However, if we look more carefully at this increased level of glee activity, you can see that it's true at early developmental time points, but in fact, it rapidly decreases back to uh, normal levels. So you see a transient increase in glee activity, which isn't sustained, and it returns back to normal levels over time. So what could explain the transience in that increase in glee activity? So as I mentioned, one of the target genes for hedgehog signaling uh, within responding cells is a negative regulator patched. And so if we look at uh, patched expression comparing uh, control embryos to GLEE3 mutants, we see substantially increased levels of patched expression when we remove GLEE3. So first of all, that's consistent with that transient increase in GLEE activity. We're seeing more expression of the target gene. In addition, because it's a negative regulator of the pathway, that would provide a way of regulating um, the level of hedgehog signaling and returning it back to more normal levels. And indeed, that increased level of patch is present at early developmental time points, but later on we see much more normal levels of patch within the neural tube. Okay, so put that together. So we've got this transient increase in uh, hedgehog signaling that doesn't lead to a change in the pattern in the ventral neural tube. And I'm arguing that there's no change in the pattern because the effect of the transcriptional network buffers. So you have a delay before you can induce NKX22. So the prediction then is if we perturb the transcriptional network at the same time as we increase hedgehog signaling, then we should reveal uh, a, a defect in the GLEE3 mutant. And indeed, that's the case. So again, I'm afraid the genetics are complicated again here. So if we just focus on the NKX22 domain, in the absence of GLEE3, it uh, looks very similar to uh, a wild-type embryo. In a PAC6 mutant, I've already shown you that 
uh, NKX22 is expanded in a PAC6 mutant. However, if we look in a PAC6 GLE3 double mutant, now that expansion of NKX22 is even more prominent, so it's going up to about halfway in the neural tube. So the absence of GLE3 in a PAC6 mutant exacerbates the PAC6 phenotype, even though in a wild type the absence of GLE3 has no effect. So that's consistent with this idea that the transcriptional network is buffering, is affecting the dynamics of how cells are responding to hedgehog. Okay. So another feature of the, um, that came out, another thing that the analyzing the, the model highlighted to us is this uh, feature of bistability or hysteresis. And again, if you're used to thinking about um, these type of models, it won't be surprising to you, given the amount of cross-oppressive interactions within the network, that it, it generates bistability. But this, we thought, was particularly, could be particularly informative in the, if we just think about the regulation of NKX22. So I've shown you that NKX22 requires the highest level of signaling to be induced. And that's because uh, you're starting from an initial condition where all of the repressors of NKX22 are expressed. Therefore, to get NKX22 on, you require sufficient level of signaling to overcome all of its repressors. So once you've established NKX22 expression, you've repressed its repressors, and now NKX22 is contributing to repressing its repressors. And therefore, it's, uh, you're able to sustain NKX22 with lower levels of hedgehog signaling. So you have to drop the level of hedgehog signaling significantly beyond the level required to activate it in order to return back to the basal level. Yeah. Sorry? Hedgehog signaling is critical one and is critical two. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. yeah, so these are, so you've got a, this is the level of NKX22. Yeah, so there's an unstable, there would be in the full portrait, there would be uh, a, an unstable steady state between the two. Yeah, I haven't plotted it, so it's there. So this is a cartoon, this is not the full, yeah. Yeah. What happens when you simulate the model? Does it really work close to the steady state? I guess what, that, what I'm asking is... Yeah, yeah, can I it hold that? That's in green, right? Yeah, so one second for that. So that comes back to your question you had yesterday. Yeah. Yes. Why one would have? So we know from the genetics, taking out Pac six has an effect. So that's what we're trying. To so the bistability. So. Um, Again, this will depend on the parameterization, of course. So there will be some bistability, depending on the parameterization, just coming from you know, the other cross-repressive, the other toggle switches within that network. But the region of bistability is sensitive to the various parameters describing those, those interactions. This is a one-parameter bifurcation. I mean, we haven't got a bifur bifurcation diagram specifically here. I mean, we can talk about, in fact, yeah, I don't want to get into this really today, but in fact, um, this, in fact, this model will give you regions of tristability as well if you want. So again, if we look at the whole bifurcation diagram, we can find regions of bistability and tristability.
Okay, so this is, right. So the prediction here is that you should be able to sustain NKX22 expression with lower levels of signaling than required to induce expression. So again, that suggests an experiment. Again, the experiment is a little complicated, but it allows us to exploit the explants again. So the experiment here is we can explant those regions of neural tissue from chick embryos and then expose those explants to uh, different amounts of hedgehog for different periods of time. So we just take one of those explants, expose it to high concentrations for nanomolar hedgehog for 18 hours, we turn on NKX22. If you continue at that level of hedgehog signaling for 36 hours, you maintain NKX22. If at 18 hours we reduce the level of hedgehog signaling, and we're doing that by adding an inhibitor of smoothing, an inhibitor of the hedgehog signaling pathway, and we're, ju we're reducing the level about threefold at the 18-hour time point, and then look at 36 hours, we're still able to maintain NKX22 expression. If, however, we use that level of hedgehog signaling from time zero and assay at 36 hours, we see that level of hedgehog signaling, which is able to maintain NKX22, isn't able to efficiently induce NKX22 in those explants. So that's consistent with this idea of bistability. We can maintain NKX22 with a lower level of signaling than is required to initially induce it. So then, okay, so I've argued that this, uh, the network can also explain how the cells are interpreting these changing dynamics of um, GLI activity. But there's also another feature of this which comes back to Stefano's question about, so you can ask maybe why, why have these complicated dynamics of signaling? So another feature of um, this, these type of systems by stability is that close to, um, close to these points, the critical points are regions of where uh, the system will change very slowly. So you have this sort of uh, what are often termed dynamical ghosts or dynamical slowing, where essentially there's a, a ghost of the a steady state left within the system. So although it's not a steady state, the system will change extremely slowly if you're within this region of parameter, within this region of parameter space. So, okay, so just to illustrate this idea, um, we can simulate the model um, with a level of glee activity uh, that goes through the dynamical go, so we can use a, a level of hedgehog signaling that is far away from um, the bifurcation point. Sorry? The heterozygote, uh, we haven't we haven't documented a phenotype in the heterozygote. Um, so we've not noticed one. But remember, there's quite a lot of redundancy there. So OLIG2, PAX6, and Iroquois 3 are all able to repress NKX22. So, okay, so what do simulations look like? So if we use a value of the activity that um, either goes through the ghost or is much higher and avoids the ghost, so now we're looking in uh, three dimensions here with uh, PAC6, OLIG2, and NKX22. So the simulations start out at PAC6. You add glee activity to those, and they transient towards an OLIG2 state. They don't, they don't end up in an OLIG2 state. Instead, the transient OLIG2 then results in the system relaxing into an NKX22 state. So if you look at the dynamics of this going near the OLIG2 steady state, so through the dynamical ghost, or uh, avoiding that entirely, what you can see is that if you're near that, um, that bifurcation point, then the cells, the system really slows down through there. You can see it really trying to squeeze through that region of dynamical space before eventually falling into the NKX22. So that would suggest, right, so one possibility why you have um, these adapting dynamics is that gives you a way of avoiding 
these kind of uh, regions of dynamical space. So by having a high level of uh, hedgehog signaling that then reduces, it allows you to avoid going near the OLIG2 steady state, but the bistability within the system allows you to maintain NKX22 once you're in that steady state. Does that answer your question? Okay, so, that, so let me summarize uh, what I've said so far. So I've made an argument that this uh, transcriptional network, this circuit, is sufficient to, or explains how you generate two boundaries within the neural tube. It allows the, both the spatial and temporal or concentration and um, duration of hedgehog signaling to be interpreted to generate these two boundaries. And it has some other interesting features. So it has by stability, which could explain how you maintain uh, levels, of, levels of gene expression, how you maintain these domains of gene expression once um, you've established them. And the requirement for sustained high levels of hedgehog signaling uh, suggests that it gives you some robustness to transient fluctuations in signal. To get into the NKX22 state, you need to maintain high enough levels for a sufficient period of time. And that is, uh, simulated the noise. Yeah. So, and is there, by looking at your data, do it, I mean, they look pretty sharp, the balance, but I'm wondering, do you really think the noise is maybe following the system after one night, or at least after a second night? Yeah, and, and there are several sources of noise. So I think you're thinking of signal noise, which I think in, so hedgehog signaling, glee activity, which I agree, there could be noise in that. Of course, there can be noise, stochastic noise, actually within the system itself. So and this is a question we're interested in, and we're trying to start to do some measurements to, to allow us to get some ballpark estimates of this. So I think there's possibility of noise in the signal, possibility of noise within the circuit itself. But in addition, remember that this tissue is growing at the same time as patterning is being established. So an additional component of this is actually cell growth and the allocation of daughter cells within the tissue itself. And that could also be, a, that may actually be the most significant component for um, boundary precision. And I agree the boundaries are reasonably sharp, but they're not perfect. So you do see misplaced cells, and the boundaries are not straight. They wiggle with a certain um, wiggliness. Yeah, I also think that the mechanism you suggested of not trying to not to look at yeah. critical points would maybe actually be more relevant to avoid that you have a lot of noise in when different cells jump. Yeah, exactly. Very yeah. Time of commitment if you were exactly. To the point yeah. Noise, right. It's probably even more important yeah. slowing down, right? I mean, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. That is, that is true, but I took the slide out. So, exactly. So, you can, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where do I get to? Yeah. Uh, so do I understand correctly that the certain time uh, in a certain sonic edge of uh, uh, intensity, you specify, you define your, your fate, and this is a stable point of your uh, network? So, so these, so there, yes, the NKX22. So this is a stationary point. There is a fast dynamic that relaxes to that fate. That's right. Okay, so what, what is... So maybe you can say that's, yeah, here. Exactly. And all of this is happening very quickly, much more quickly than what you have plotted on the x-axis of that phase diagram of your axis. Is it happening? Axis of time. No. Happening more quickly. What do you mean happening more quickly? Because if it's a phase diagram, then every point should, should be at a stationary point. Ah, oh, I see what you say. Yeah, so this is, it's, it's a cartoon, right? And it, it, this is... This is trying to illustrate that it is changing over time, and it's also complicated because of the bi-stability, right? So th this is not, you know, the whole thing is not a conservative system. 
So in fact, you've got to imagine that this is a snapshot of the phase portrait, which will, it will change over time depending on the, the position of the system within, within the landscape. Is that, is that okay? So, for example, the bistability will mean that crossing this boundary will change the position of this boundary. Right. Okay. All right. How are we doing in time? So, I think, so I'm going to switch gears now. So, um, so 20 minutes. So what I want to do now is, in the last 20 minutes, hopefully talk a little bit about the molecular implementation, so I guess the genomic implementation of this circuit. So I could do that, or I could, the alternative would be to talk for 10 minutes uh, on more of the maths on an analytical. Yeah. Maybe let's, let's try this. It's, so less maths and more bioinformatics. Is that okay? Okay. So, right, so I've talked to you about the neural tube. First of all, I want to make the point about the gap gene system. So you've already heard about the gap gene system being patterned by gradients of bicoid and caudal, and the gap genes themselves, like those neural progenitor transcription factors, um, cross-repress each other. And if you look at the overall strategy of the gap gene system, and many people have done this. Uh, Thomas, you heard about, from earlier uh, this week, but many other people, so Steve Small, Yogi Jaeger, John Reinitz, have also looked at the gap gene system. And many of the things that I've told you about the neural tube also appear to be true in um, the gap gene system. So a graded signal regulating cross-repressive uh, transcription factors, the combination of which uh, generates dynamic spatial pattern within the tissue. So how does this work at a gene regulation level? So we briefly mentioned yesterday uh, some, a little bit about enhancers and the fact that the enhancers are complicated. So what I want to do is, first of all, summarize sort of an overview of what's known uh, for a specific example in the gap gene system and then talk about some of our recent work trying to do a similar thing in the neural tube, us and other people as well. So if we think about the gap gene system, then if we think about a particular stripe of gene expression, so an enhancer which gives us a, a regulatory element which drives gene expression along at a particular AP position. So that enhancer is active in that stripe of gene expression. Um, the work of, again, many people here is just summarizing. This is a review I wrote with Steve, which summarizes some of this. So that enhancer um, will have several inputs into it. So a, an input from bicoid, which is your, uh, your spatial polarized input, if you like. Uh, so an input from the morphogen itself. Also inputs from spatially uniform uh, expressed transcription factors. So Steve and others in Drosophila have done a lot of work with Zelda, which is an activator of genes expressed along the entire AP axis. And finally, inputs from the gap genes themselves, so that repressive interaction. So this is sort of the molecular equivalent to the components of, that, of the mathematical model. So a morphogen input, a uniform input, and then um, repressive input from the network itself. And so, in many cases, those three classes of input appear to be integrated actually at the level of the cis-regulatory elements, at the level of the enhancers. So you can find in enhancers in many cases which recapitulate these patterns of gene expression. And looking at the transcription factors that bind to those enhancers, they will contain binding sites for those three types of input, for the morphogen, the spatially uniform inputs, and the, the network inputs, the gap gene inputs. And then the kind of transgenic um, enhancer bashing experiments can be done to ask what is the role for uh, each of those inputs. So while as an intact 
cis regulatory element recapitulates the full uh, pattern of expression. If you uh, knock out individual components, so the um, so this uh, component here no longer able to bind, then you see uh, repression and vice versa. So in each case, you can look at the individual roles of those components and come to the conclusion that regulatory elements are integrating these three types of input. So the repressive input from the network, uniform activators, and then the morphogen effector. So then if we think about this in the context of the network itself, you can imagine the scenario where uh, regulatory elements are essentially the edges in the network. So they provide the means to interpret, to integrate those three types of input. And the dynamics created by the cross-regulation generate the dynamics we're seeing uh, in the spatial patterns of expression. So trying to summarize that then. So how do, at the level of regulatory elements, how does the interpretation work? How do you convert the graded input into discrete responses? So it's the network itself which transforms the signal to pattern, and the enhancers are doing that heavy lifting. So they're integrating those multiple inputs, so the morphogen, uniform, spatially uniform inputs, and uh, the network itself. And that collective, that network generates the dynamics we're seeing. Okay, so this is increasingly well established in the gap gene system of this kind of modular arrangement where enhancer elements are integrating these multiple inputs. So it's the same principle at work in the neural tube. So I want to summarize some data from my lab but also from uh, other people's lab. And I think the next few slides are going to be quite heavy, so bear with me, but I want to summarize at the end. So first off, so uh, Tony Ustervin, working in Johan Eriksson's lab, looked at, tried to identify regulatory elements associated with some of our favorite genes, so some of which you've already heard about, like NKX22 and OLIG2. And so they've managed to identify regulatory elements, which if they take those regulatory elements and use them to make transgenic reporters, recapitulate many of the patterns of gene expression uh, we're aware of. So, for example, this element coming from close to the NKX22 locus drives in a pattern of expression corresponding to where the endogenous NKX22 gene is expressed. And if you look at the transcription factor binding motifs within those elements, you see... Uh, evidence for glee binding, so the morphogen effector. You see SOX binding site, so SOX is a transcription factor which is uniformly expressed in the neural tube, so it is equivalent to Zelda. And then, in addition, binding sites for uh, what I'm calling the neural progenitor transcription factors, so the other components of the network. So Andy McMahon's lab, Kevin Peterson, uh, and others in Andy McMahon's lab want, went one step further and looked for biochemical evidence for binding of individual transcription factors. And consistent with the bioinformatic analysis, then they can find evidence that GLE proteins and the SOX proteins are biochemically binding to many of those regulatory elements. So we've got, so, so far, two components of this idea. So morphogen effectors and... Uh, uniform activators binding to the uh, regulatory elements, binding to the same regulatory elements associated with the, um, the neural progenitor transcription factors. And similar to the experiments I've shown you, you can then go in and ask whether those elements are required. So, for example, an element associated with a ventrally expressed transcription factor, NKX 6.1, contains binding sites for um, the morphogen effect of the uniform activator and for two neural progenitor transcription factors. And when those are mutated, you can see individually mutated within the context of the regulatory element, you can see the predicted outcome. So, for example, removing the repressive input from uh, that binds DBX results in an expansion of NKX 
whereas removing the SOX or the GLE elements results in the absence of or very much lower gene expression. Okay, so this is all consistent with that idea that you have these integrative regulatory elements. <coughs> so what questions do we want to answer? So, so far there's biochemical evidence for the GLE and the SOX family binding to those uh, elements. But is it also true that the neuroprogenitor transcription factors are also binding? The bioinformatics would support that, but is there biochemical evidence for this? Moreover, we focused on the transcription factors themselves, but is this strategy true for the entire transcriptional program of each of the progenitor domains, not just the cross-regulating tra cross transcription factors? And then finally, how do you actually get domain specificity out of this? How do you get those discrete domains of gene expression? Can I ask a slightly provocative question? Yeah. Is there any evidence that in terms of single processing, these enhancers are doing much? Uh, what I'm saying, like, you had a model before, right, in which you just assume some very simple regulation, probably, right, yeah. of the genes, and then yeah. you can build this model to spare the dynamics of the transcription yeah. factor. You run it, and it's sort of it's yeah. your system that you can think that the answer does do all that integration to give you the right response, but it's really not doing much in terms of processing these dynamics. Or do we know of an example in which the answer is essential? You see I mean, it's I, I so like so I in sig the there has to be a molecular implementation of those of the network I diagram. Know, but so they're doing anything other than. Right, so for example, think of the if strike. I can just say whenever you don't have the repressor yeah. and you have the okay. meter, yeah. that's what's on, but yeah. is that transforming the signal in any way? Or, or, so yeah, so I think that's an interesting question, it's right? It's just a reader, yeah. but it's not really doing So, I mean, this is, yeah, this is the type of argument that I used to have with Eric Davidson, because Eric Davidson was a proponent of the idea that developmental. Uh, the logic of developmental gene expression had to be Boolean. So a gene was either on or off, which is, I think, what you're implying, right? So these elements, all they're doing is they're saying, does the gene turn on or does it turn off? So I think, I think experimentally, our approaches have not been sufficiently subtle or sophisticated yet to answer that question. And I think over the next few years, we'll begin to answer that with types of experiments where we can really precisely gene edit regulatory elements within the context of the genome. So not relying on transgenics or um, ectopic expression type experiments, but where we're manipulating regulatory elements, deleting them or altering them in subtle ways and asking what effect that has on gene expression. So that would give us a much more subtle readout than simple presence or absence of gene expression. Yeah, I don't. So, in terms of signal processing, what kind of thing are you thinking of? What do you mean? I mean, I, I just like is now. If I knew the dynamics of the transcription factor, I could predict the naively the dynamics of the downstream target without knowing much about yeah. the architecture, how many binding sites are there, yeah. how much like how much that I see. knowing the step, yeah. Knowing the geometry and yeah, yeah. the biochemistry of the yeah. answer, how much predictive power does it yeah. give me as opposed to just, yeah. I just yeah. put any function in sufficient tool. Right, so I guess that's sort of what level of abstraction do you want to describe the system in? So the that high level that the type of model I described just gives you yeah, is that the, that level sufficient? Yeah, I guess for most of the depends what answer you want to yeah. get, right? It's, yeah. 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 Uh, it's not binding, that's activity. So it says that so it says that uh, SOX and glee are required for activity. That doesn't mean that other things are not binding to it. Okay, let me push on. <laughs>
So, okay, so to address these questions, we've taken advantage, and I'll mention this again tomorrow, but I've taken advantage of being able now to make uh, large amounts of specific neural progenitors from ES cells. Um, so that allows us to do the kind of biochemical experiments that haven't been possible with embryos. So essentially what we can do is take ES cells and then convert them, uh, a big plate of cells, into um, uh, progenitors which have the molecular characteristic of specific regions of the neural tube. So now we have millions of progenitors in which we can do experiments. So one thing we can do then is look biochemically at the binding of these key neural progenitor transcription factors and ask that question of whether we see biochemical evidence for uh, interactions with specific uh, enhancers. I won't go into the details. The answer is yes, we can see uh, binding at those regulatory elements. So those elements bind glee, bind morphogen effector, uniform activators, and uh, the neural progenitor transcription factors. The other thing we can do now with this system is look at the entire transcriptional program of particular progenitor domains. So not just looking at the individual transcription factors you're used to seeing, but looking at the entire uh, gene expression changes and define specific gene expression associated with each of those domains. So, okay, so we've got three uh, regions of the neural tube now in the dish. So dorsal uh, uh, progenitors, motor neuron progenitors, and the very the NKX22 progenitor domain. And we have um, gene expression for each of those domains plus the, um, the evidence of binding of those three inputs. So how does, where does specificity come from? So we can ask, first of all, whether there's any difference in the binding of the Glee proteins and the SOX proteins, the morphogen input and the uh, uniform input. And the answer is there isn't. So if we look at um, the binding of the morphogen input at genes which are induced in the ventral neural tube, whether they're in the P3 domain or the motor neuron domain, 70% of the entire gene expression program binds to the Glee proteins. And similarly, uh, many of those regulatory elements also bind to the uniform activator inputs. So there's no, there's no obvious difference if we look at these two ventral domains about the positive inputs into, into those uh, domains. So how do you distinguish, how do you get a difference in the transcriptional program between those two adjacent progenitor domains? And you can see that there's a substantial uh, tens scores of genes are differentially expressed between those, um, those two domains. So, okay, so the obvious hypothesis is that to generate the green domain, the NKX22 expressing P3 domain cells, NKX22 is specifically expressed in that domain, and it acts to repress not only OLIG2, but all of the genes which are uniquely expressed in those OLIG2 expressing motor neuron progenitors. So to ask that question, we generated, we in this case, sorry, I've taken a name off, but Eva Kutiova in the lab generated uh, sets of ES cells where we can uh, ectopically induce specific transcription factors such as NKX22 artificially using um, uh, a drug induction system. So now we have ES cells which we can differentiate into neural progenitors, then independently manipulate gene expression with, within them. So the experiment then to test this hypothesis is to uh, convert ES cells into motor neuron progenitors and then artificially induce NKX22 in those motor neuron progenitors and ask what effect that has on the gene expression program. And what we see if we do that, comparing motor neurons progenitors to <coughs> motor neuron progenitors in which we've induced NKX22, is that we now uh, repress many of the motor neuron specific genes. And many of those motor neuron specific genes are, uh, have regulatory elements that bind to NKX22. So, what that suggests then is for the motor neuron program and the P3 program, both of those, both of the genes associated with those programs have uh, binding sites, have regulatory elements that bind the morphogen effector and the 
neural-specific SOX genes, but the motor neuron program is specifically repressed by NKX22. So in addition then, so if you think about this, right, so we're talking about these two adjacent domains, but in addition you need to keep off all of the other uh, domain-specific expression within the P3 domain. And we can go on to show that that is again directly by NKX22. So the P3 program, those cells express NKX22, and one of the roles of NKX22 is to repress all of the other non-adjacent programs. So everything that shouldn't be expressed in uh, the P3 progenitor domain is being repressed by NKX22. Okay, when I say everything, I've exaggerated a little bit. So if we look at the induction of NKX22, it, it represses about 80% of the program, but there's some genes which are not repressed by NKX22. If we look at the NKX22 domain, it's co-expressing this other transcription factor, NKX6.1. So we can do the same experiment now with NKX6.1. And what's really striking is the forced expression of NKX6.1 represses those genes which are not repressed by NKX22. And the combination of both now give us the full P3 program. And again, we can show direct binding. Okay. So the combination of NKX22 and NKX6.1 is imposing a P3 transcription program by repressing everything that shouldn't be expressed in the P3 domain. So if we think about the motor neuron progenitor domain now, NKX22 is absent, but in place of NKX22, OLIG2 is expressed. So does OLIG2 replace NKX22 in repressing everything that shouldn't be in the motor neuron domain? And indeed it does. You can do the same experiments, ectopically express OLIG2, show that it uh, inhibits uh, the dorsal progenitor program and binds to many of those genes. Moreover, if we look at where OLIG2, the regulatory elements that OLIG2 is binding, then in 75% of the cases, it's binding to the same element that NKX22 is binding to in the P3 domain. So that suggests a model. So remember, NKX22 and OLIG2 are not expressed in the same cell types, but they do interact with the same regulatory elements to repress the same uh, uh, set of genes. So there, there's, and those dynamics of gene expression mean OLIG2 is initially bound to those elements, then NKX22 represses, or replaces OLIG2, repressing the same set of genes. So that comes back to this idea with, in many cases, the cis regulatory elements of target genes contain a combination of uh, neural progenitor transcription factor binding sites, and it's that combination that allows the serial repression of the, uh, the non-expressed genes within um, inappropriate progenitors. Okay, so that's really complicated. So this is my attempt to summarize that. So if we think about the ventral progenitor transcription factor programs, which are dependent on hedgehog signaling, many of those genes have uh, regulatory elements that bind to the morphogen effector of the Gli proteins plus the uniform transcription factor, SOX. So that is sufficient to induce expression within the ventral uh, half of the neural tube. Domain specificity is then imposed by the neural progenitor transcription factors themselves, repressing all of the inappropriate gene expression. So you end up specifying domain-specific gene expression through a derepression mechanism. It's those things which aren't being repressed which define uh, the domain of gene expression. Okay, so in words, this is my attempt to summarize that. So the cis regulatory elements, those enhancer elements, integrate multiple positive morphogen and uniform inputs plus multiple negative inputs, those neuroprogenitive transcription factors. The positive inputs are broadly activating, so they're broadly acti acting, activating many of the ventral programs, and it's the repressors which select identity by inhibiting all of the alternative programs. And it's the dynamics of the network which generate, eventually generate the spatial pattern. So another way of saying that is 
The morphogen is there activating all possible programs, and it's the transcriptional network which selects the appropriate outcome for the position in the neural tube. And that's based on this combinatorial mechanism acting through shared regulatory elements. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say. So I hope you know something a little bit about neural tube patterning now. And just to try and sort of summarize the main points, if we compare what I've been talking about in the neural tube and particularly compare that to uh, gap genes, but also many other morphogen tissues, I think you can come up with sort of three sort of principles here. So you have morphogens are there providing gradients of signal which initiate tissue patterning, provide some initial polarization. But on their own, they're not sufficient to generate the pattern. They're generated by uh, modular regulatory elements uh, integrating multiple inputs to control target gene expression. And then uh, interactions, regulatory interactions between some of those target genes, the transcription factors, generate dynamics which eventually, which the dynamics of which divide the uh, tissue into a series of domains arrayed along that uh, patterning axis. And going back right to the first point I wanted to make yesterday, the fact that we're seeing this repeatedly in different examples in different tissues where there are many differences and no evolutionary uh, common origin suggests that these principles may well be uh, general principles for how you pattern a tissue in response to a, a graded signal. So these are only some of the people uh, from my lab and some of the collaborators which have been involved in this work. Thank you very much.